Okay, um, thank you, Bao Hong, for the kind introduction and uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Jingji and um, today I will talk to you about my PhD work uh, on how we can use mechanical engineering principles and for the healthcare related applications. So in specific on um, breast cancer detection. So, um, okay, let me, I have to make sure I minimize myself. Sorry. Um, okay, so uh, first a little bit of background. Um, sorry, as we are probably all aware, cancer is a global health issue. And uh, whereas breast cancer is the most common type of cancer occurred in women, and actually one in every eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer during their lifetimes. These are alarming statistics arising from the fact that there are limitations in both the current detection and treatment method, which makes the ability to detect the lesion early and to treat them locally especially important. We are focusing on a subtype of cancer called triple negative breast cancer. And as its name suggests, it's triple negative, meaning it's not ER, PR, or HER2 receptor positive. But the current established um, treatment method is used to target either of these three receptors. So this means the triple negative breast cancer is not responsive to any of the current established um, uh, treatment techniques. And in addition, it can exhibit benign features in different in medical imaging modalities, which makes the detection and treatment even more difficult. So therefore, there is a clear need that uh, we want to offer um, alternative method for the detection and diagnosis of triple negative breast cancer. So here um, in this talk, I'll present to you um, two different approaches. And the first would be how we can use tumor specific nanoparticles for the targeting of uh, triple negative breast cancer. Uh, one of the most common imaging modality in the breast cancer detection is magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. Um, so here is a human breast tumor showing up in MRI. The current resolution of MRI is on the order of millimeters and that corresponding to hundreds of millions of cancer cells with a higher chance the tumor is already being a later stage. So it is important to enhance the spatial resolution and also help identify where the lesion is. As I just mentioned, uh, triple negative breast cancer uh, tumor, they do not express the three common expressed receptors that have been found on the majority of the tumors, but uh, they exhibited uh, like over 50% of triple negative breast cancer, they exhibited another type of the receptor called luteinizing hormone releasing hormone, uh, LHRH. And uh, these are the receptors which you can see expressing this uh, green fluorescence on the cancer cells, but are absent on the normal cells. So taking this biological feature, we're hearing trying to design LHRH functionalized nanoparticles and aiming to uh, specifically target those overexpressed LHRH receptors on the cancer cells. And our ultimate goal here is to, in the whole body imaging, we were able to identify the lesion and also enhance the lesion. So here's the structure of um, um, our nanoparticle. It has a magnetite core with a polyethylene glycol coating that's aimed to improve the monodispersity and also to reduce, uh, enhance the circulation time inside of the body. And uh, we attach tryptorolin, which is an early charge agonist, it's a type of ligand on the surface of these nanoparticles for the specific targeting. And um, this is before conjugation, this is after conjugation. And from the TM images, we can also see that uh, there is, uh, the particles preserve the good monodispersity and uh, um, spherical shape after conjugation. And this suggested that there is negligible aggregation occurred during this process. So there are actually many people worked on the ligand conjugated nanoparticle. So what makes our different, make, what makes our work different and unique is that we're really studying this mechanical interaction between these nanoparticle and the cell membrane uh, to understand how these interaction contribute to the specific targeting process. And here uh, we first studied the adhesion in the specific targeting using both um, experimental and MD simulation approaches. First, we want to quantify the adhesive interaction in this specific uh, targeting uh, using atomic force microscopy. And during this approach, we first functionalized the AFM tip uh, with either peptide, uh, tryptorolin, or nanoparticles, or functionalized nanoparticles, and brought this into contact to measure its adhesion to the uh, cell-coded um, cover slips. So this can include either cancer cells or normal cells. And during this typical process, the tip is brought in contact to the, cell uh, to, the, um, to the cell surface, and then the cantilever undergoes elastic bending. During the retraction process, because there is interaction between the tip and the surface, so it cannot detach after force of zero. 
but uh, the cantilever will keep undergoing elastic bending until it's being detached from the surface and then return to the um, uh, baseline. So this jump off force here is uh, what we call adhesion forces that we're interested in quantifying for. So here we summarize the different adhesion uh, forces between different uh, uh, tip and the surface pairs. So these include um, triptorolling ligands, uh, nanoparticles or triptorolling nanoparticle ligands uh, and their interaction to either breast cancer cell or normal breast cell. So uh, from this um, summary plot, we see that uh, when we have functionalized nanoparticles, their interaction to the breast cancer cells are over four, uh, four folds to, that, uh, to the normal cells. So indicating that there is a specific interaction. And again, this is due to the overexpressed LHR receptors on the surface of triple negative breast cancer cells. Uh, what is um, out of our expectation and we found it interesting is, in this case, even though there is no uh, LHR receptors on the surface of the nanoparticles, there is still a appreciable amount, actually over six-fold of increase uh, of the pack-coated nanoparticles interacting to the cancer cells compared to the normal cells. So this um, helps us understand that actually the pack coating also serves as a um, additional effect, additional effect to uh, facilitate the adhesion to the cancer cells as well. We further try to understand uh, where these adhesion interactions coming from from a molecular uh, perspective using MD simulation. And here um, we study this uh, adhesion between different uh, surface interaction pairs. And these include um, triptorolling ligand and uh, uh, pack coating on the surface of the nanoparticle to the LHR receptors and uh, lipids on the cell membrane. So what we found is there is indeed a appreciable amount of interaction between receptor ligand, but the highest interaction actually coming from the PAC and other charge receptors. So this is uh, consistent with what we have just observed from the atomic force microscopy measurement. Um, so from this MD simulation, we see that uh, this interaction energy is really coming from the secondary interactions with the major contributors coming from electrostatic interactions and Van der Waals interaction. So in this part, we looked into there is um, specific, uh, there is a specificity between, um, fun, uh, between receptor and ligand interaction. And this specificity can lead nanoparticle entry into the biological cells through a process called receptor-mediated endocytosis. And in this part of the talk, um, we present uh, a, a combined theoretical and experimental study to understanding this um, specific pathway for the nanoparticle to enter. So um, during this um, endocytosis um, process, there is a change of the free energy of the cell membrane, which can be mainly divided into three parts. And uh, first, there is the receptor ligand binding. You can think about it as the lock and key system. And this specifically leads to the elevated elastic bending energy of the cell membrane to encapsulate the particle. And finally, there is a loss of configurational entropy of receptors due to immobilization. And we first looked into how a single particle enter into the cell membrane. And we studied it by uh, looking at Professor Hua Gao's work um, on the mechanics of receptor, uh, receptor mediated endocytosis. Some of you may already see the work. So what is happening here is when a single individual particle inter interact with the surface of the cell membrane, the local receptor density will arise to the same level of the ligand density that is expressed on the, um, that's being uh, on the surface of the nanoparticle. And this will lead to the local depletion of the receptor density at the contact front compared to the original receptor density at the re remote location. So here, by incorporating all the change of the uh, cell membrane energy terms, we can write um, the equation Ft, which is um, um, talking about uh, the change of the uh, cell membrane energy in a single particle entry. But um, during our experimental observation, we see that the particle do not really enter as a single identity, but they rather, they rather enter as a cluster, meaning they have a lot of nan nanoparticles and uh, they have their neighbors. So therefore, we extended this model developed by Professor Gao to into the case where we consider the cluster entry uh, by looking, by incorporating additional terms coming from the nanoparticle, nanoparticle interactions. So from this approach, we were able to get a new change of free energy equation of the cell membrane, which is shown here um, in, in, uh, in the form of um, Ft. By balancing the chemical potential of the receptors, uh, we can write the expression of the Cy plus, 
which is um, the receptor density at the contact front. And um, this is important because for this encapsulation process to occur, there are two boundary conditions have to, have to satisfy. One of which is this uh, uh, contact uh, density, uh, the local density at contact front has to be smaller compared to the original receptor density remote. So there is a diffusion process that can drive more receptors towards the contact area for this encapsulation to um, complete. And in the second case, the total number of receptors remains to be constant. So this is the conservation of energy. And from this analysis, we can see that uh, there is a range that the cell membrane can encapsulate. So that is between 15 nanometers to roughly 900 nanometer of the radius. And we also looked into how long this process would take by meaning the wrapping time uh, when a particle gets in contact with the cell membrane to the points being fully encapsulated. And here uh, we're studying two cases. First is when the nanoparticle get in contact with the normal cell membrane where there is less receptor density. And another case is high receptor density. <clears throat> and um, um, by summarizing the time for um, both the normal and the cancer cell membrane to encapsulate the same amount of the same size of the particle, we see that uh, uh, the particle that can enter into um, the, the cancer cells are significantly less. So this also suggested that uh, it become kinetically more favorable for the functionalized nanoparticle to enter into cancer cells compared to the normal cells. And by looking into um, cellular uptake between the functionalized particles and breast cancer cells at different time, uh, we see that after three hours, there is appreciable more, more, more amount of the nanoparticle being encapsulated and internalized into the nuclei and cytoplasm of the cell compared to the ones at one hour. So these are also in agreement with uh, what we just predicted. And finally, we tested our um, uh, nanoparticles in the in animals by uh, inoculating the mice with uh, dental grafted uh, human tumors. So from uh, intravenous injection, which means the nanoparticles undergo um, systemic um, uh, circulation, we see that uh, with functionalized nanoparticles after 24 hours of injection, there is a more significant amount of attenuation in the MR imaging. So this result suggested that these functionalized particles can find their way to target the lesion compared to those without the, uh, with the um, ligands. And through the intratumoral injection, meaning we inject uh, the particles directly into the tumor, we see that uh, um, also in the case of functionalized particles, it can stay. So these are the, um, this is being darkening effect. So we can see the dark darkening effect keep persistent for over two weeks. So this helps also um, indicate that these functionalized particles can stay in tumor for much longer time without uh, uh, without being depleted by the body. And this can help with the long-term monitoring of the whole body uh, in MRI. So in the first part, I talked to you how we can use the biological features uh, to detect the cancer outside, uh, inside of the body using MRI. And in the second part, I want to switch the gear a little bit and talk to you about how we can use cell mechanics as physical biomarkers that can help us to detect the cancer outside of the body. And um, there are already a lot of two common toolboxes especially um, established to assessment of cell mechanical properties. And uh, they are all associated with their advantages and also limitations. For example, in the case of AFM, it is associated with the local indentation of the mechanical properties of the cell. And there has been debating on whether mechanical transduction will um, affect this uh, cell properties. And in the case of the optical tracers, because we're using a source of the laser beam, so there is also a limit, potential limitations and challenge on how the thermal, uh, thermal damage of the soft biological tissue. And in the case of particle tracking microbiology and traction force microscopy, there is a need to infuse external tracer beads to assess um, the change of the cell um, properties. And our goal here is try to understand the cell behavior in a physiological mimical environment and we also want to track the different compartments within the cell and to correlate that with the different cell metastasis um, states in the case of the triple negative breast cancer. So to do that, uh, we develop a different uh, platform by using microfluid chamber and digital image correlation. So basically the cell is um, sitting inside of the chamber that can subject it to the laminar flow, mimicking its uh, physiological environment. And digital image correlation is a non-destructive method to track the movement of the same spot at different time points. 
the beauty of the cell is it's a naturally patented material, meaning that we can use the DIC to directly um, track the patterns on the cell at different time points to get its um, uh, strain or stress states of the whole cell body at a different compartment inside of the cell, meaning that there is no need to introduce external tracers or microbeads uh, to monitor this process as was being done in the microbiology. And we noticed that uh, from this approach, the cell um, exhibited um, time-dependent string evolution, and actually it exhibited a three-stage creep phenomenon. And using a generalized Maxwell model, we were able to fit it to the primary creep regime and extrapolate important um, viscoelastic properties. And here uh, we summarize the modulus and also the viscosity of uh, uh, three different type of the cells for both the nucleus and the cytoplasm. So um, these three cells include normal breast cells, less metastatic triple negative breast cancer cells, and highly metastatic triple negative breast cancer cells. And what we can notice here is uh, nuclei uh, often uh, exhibited much higher uh, modulus compared to the cytoplasm, uh, also in the terms of the viscosity. This actually makes sense because the nuclei um, has overall become, it is, is relatively more stiffer compared to the cytoplasm. But what is more important is that we see an overall downward trend uh, in both the modulus and the viscosity when the cell becoming highly metastatic. So these results suggested that our methodology uh, was able to successfully differentiate cancer cells with different metastatic potential. And uh, we envision that uh, we can also extend this methodology for the detection and diagnosis of other type of human diseases as well. And we also want to correlate how, um, how the change of the cytoskeleton structure correlated with the change of the cell mechanical properties. And uh, we're specifically looking to actin, uh, which has been um, shown as the major contributor to the cyto cytoskeleton structure stiffness and also the cell mechanical property. So what we're looking at here on the top three uh, movies are confocal images um, scanning the individual cells from the basal plane to the top plane. So basically coming scanning from the bottom to the top. And again, these are three different cells, including normal cells, less metastatic potential, and highly metastatic potential. And the blue corresponding to the nuclei and the green corresponding to the actin. Because uh, these stains are obtained under the same condition, so uh, what you're looking at here, the intensity of the actin uh, directly correlated to the actual amount. So, for example, in the normal, in the case of the normal breast cell, you will see, you can see that the cells are uh, more compact with a lot more actins, and uh, they also form with uh, more organized and uh, filament structure. But uh, when the cells are highly metastatic, we, you can see there's a significant loss of the actin amount and also the, um, the structure become disorganized with sparse um, um, acting fibers around, not like the bundles or long filaments. So this actually helps to explain that when the cells are highly metastatic, it starts to lose its um, mechanical properties. So it helps explain why it can squeeze into smaller pores and capillaries and it can go distal. That can help it to, to um, lead to metastasis. And uh, we um, also summarize the total amount of the actin fluorescent intensity inside of these uh, uh, cells. And we see a, uh, also a clear downward trend when the cells have higher metastatic potential. And again, this, um, this result is in agreement with what we just achieved using the shear assay technique uh, by looking at the cell viscoelastic properties. So uh, to conclude, uh, in this talk, I presented to you two parts for the cancer detection. In the first case, we're looking to the role of adhesion and endocytosis um, to help with the rational design of our nanoparticles to um, help with, and to facilitate the in vivo detection in the case of the whole body MRI imaging for um, detect the cancer inside of the body. And in the second case, I presented to you a combined um, microfluidic and DIC cor um, correlation technique uh, to use the cell mechanics as um, contactless physical biomarkers that helps to the, for the detection of the triple negative breast cancer outside of the body as a in vitro detection approach. And I hope through this um, presentation, I can convince you that there is so much we can do, especially from a mechanical engineering perspective um, that can offer alternative ways to provide insights into biological and biomedical related challenges and problems. 
And with that, I'd like to acknowledge my advisor, my research group, and uh, my collaborators for um, supporting this um, uh, for make, to supporting this work, as well as um, our funding resources that makes this work possible. And with that, I'm happy to um, take any questions. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jinjie. Does anyone have questions? I have a question. Sure. Hi, Jingjie. This is Robin. Uh, Hello. Nice to meet you. And uh, I have I have um, two questions are related. How how do you use the how do you foresee to use the shear uh, method to analyze the uh, cell anisotropy and the interaction between cell and say ECM extracellular matrix? Okay. Um, let's see. I thought. Are those like two questions? I thought you said you have two questions. Oh yeah, those are like two questions, yes. Okay, okay, sure. So um, first the question is um, an isotropy, right? So basically um, the DIC method allows us to um, um, track different compartment within the cell. So basically uh, anywhere we can, uh, where's my mouse? Yeah, for example, you can see here, right? Like this, are, this is one point on cytoplasm. Um, there's another point here, and there's a few different uh, different points at the nuclei, in the nucleus. So basically, uh, we are track we are um, discretizing uh, the biological cell into different uh, uh, smaller compartments. So we can track the different nodes and meshes, and those are corresponding to the different areas on the cell. And um, and you can see here uh, with the different uh, at different time points the evolution and uh, the deformation at different parts of the cell are different. So we can um, basically extrapolate this uh, mechanical properties at different uh, spots. And uh, we do sort of um, a summarizing and a statistical analysis to see the distribution, uh, to see whether this is on the nuclei or this is on the cytoplasm. We're only focusing on the nuclei and cytoplasm at this moment because it's more obvious. But in the future, it will be nice to see the subcellular structures if possible. So um, that is my answer to uh, hopefully the first question. And the second question is extracellular matrix. Um, here, uh, we are not really looking at extracellular matrix. Um, I guess those are like the proteins um, that our current technique cannot resolve at that resolution. But um, our um, experiment, uh, there is other publications from our group looking from the side of you, like for example, from here. And uh, you can you can flow the shear, and then the cell will detach, right? So when it's detached, it's really cleaving at the extracellular matrix, like a wrinkling, or um, yeah, like um, there there's others. Sorry, I lost my words. Anyways, there's other ECM um, proteins here, and you can think of, think about that as a fracture process. We actually have some publications on that, so that can help. So so basically, our goal here is to study the cell as a material, like a viscoelastic material, and see how it detach. From the from the from the substrate from our mechanical engineering pro approach, um, so um, yeah, just to uh, summarize, um, basically we couldn't uh, really resolve at this resolution, but uh, we're studying with a different way because ECM is um, really important. Um, I think to a certain extent it's being understudied, but um, yeah, it will be nice if we can resolve at, at that resolution, maybe with other techniques or imaging techniques. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Very thanks. nice. Robin, this is a very similar to the elastic seal. Uh, I don't know what you are talking about. <laughs> Charles work. Anyway, yeah, thank you. Any other questions from? Uh, No questions? Sure, then we thank to our speaker and uh, let's move on.